I have to read a paper by John Maynard Keynes, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. <clears throat> it was written in 1930, as you can see. Uh, this is stored at uh, econ.yale.edu. Uh, and I figured I'd record the reading and the commentary because I have to do it, and so I might as well record it. Um, all right, so so let's see. It's written in 1930, so going into the reading, what I'm thinking about is a 1929 economic collapse. It was, um, it was a 2001 type of economic collapse, sans 9-11, or, you know, more recent one, 2008 economic type collapse, and in some ways perhaps even worse, history books tell us that people were... Um, committing suicides, jumping off buildings in New York City, for example. <clears throat> Wall Street guys, money guys, uh, people lost their shirt when the stock market crashed in 1929. So we're just uh, sort of uh, in the early stages of the 19th, sorry, 20th century. Um, kind of a relatable time to us, given, given that it's 2018. So we're like, you know, at the um, first quarter, you know, of the 20th, 21st century, um, while these guys were coming in from a perspective of a first quarter of the 20th century. So 1929 economic collapse. 1939, so that's, you know, a decade later, um, World War II, um, mind you, we're only, like, put World War One behind us in 1914 or something like that, um, so a turbulent early century um, didn't continue nor end much better, I'm talking about... Uh, World War II, hmm. Vietnam, and, uh, all over the place, right? So uh, not a great time. So John Maynard Keynes, the, the, uh, the superficial reason why I'm investigating this paper is uh, he predicted the 15-hour work week, and that's the um, part of... Uh, what I'm trying to get at here, I'm writing about it. I have secondary sources that I've looked to that link to this paper. And now I have to go through the paper or else I risk not, or, or, risk, I, or else I risk missing something, um, something important. And also it helps with credibility. Like you can't talk about... Uh, it's like talking about Bible. Like no one actually reads the Bible. Um, yeah, no one's, you you have to study the Bible, right? That's a different thing. Anyways, <sighs> let's see. Another thing I should point out: he's talking to uh, the grandchildren of 1930s. So that's roughly us um, with the added benefit that we have a bit of a uh, space-time separation between uh, when John Maynard Keynes wrote this uh, paper and uh, in 1930. And now, we're slightly older than Keynes' grandchildren, I think. So we can sort of, um, looking back, we can see how accurate it was and whatnot. So that's it's an interesting angle on it as well. So let's get into it. We're suffering just now from a bad attack of economic pessimism. 1929, yeah, a year into the economic collapse. Uh, the year into what was later called a depression. 
Um, it is common to hear people say that the epoch of enormous economic progress which characterized the 19th century is over. It was common to hear people say that economic progress which characterized the 19th century is over. There's always been pessimists, you know, uh, I'm guilty of it. Um, I think we've reached the end of technology. Uh, not that technology won't be developed or improved, just that uh, we've reached the saturation point, personal saturation points. So you can evolve anything you want. There's only so much information I can receive. Um, and uh, I'm already <clears throat> saturated with information. Um, I need the opposite of that. Um, so, so, so that's interesting. Uh, that the rapid improvement in the standard of life is now going to slow down at any rate in Great Britain. That a decline in prosperity is more likely than an improvement in the decade which lies ahead of us. Was John Maynard Keynes a British fellow? Yeah, he was a British fellow. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember, too. He's writing from the perspective of uh, Britain. So all of my carrying on uh, with uh, uh, depression and whatnot, that, it's not like Britain didn't have its problems, obviously. Um, but uh, they weren't in the kind of economic depression that America was feeling. It strikes me as very much the kind of thing that was happening between America and Canada. You know, it's basically the same thing, America and Canada. Um, I know that we like to divvy ourselves up, but here we are on the same continent. Um, our access to resources, America's access to resources, is greater um, across a lot of dimensions. Uh, starting with people, Canada has, uh, Canada's population is approximately the population size of California. One out of 50 states, right? So one resource that they uh, are lacking is people compared to America. Um, uh, and then they have a lot of cold parts, which is obviously not necessarily desirable for human uh, habitation. Um, um, and so the real estate bubble that America was in, in the late 1990s and then 2000s, and um, 2001, the real estate bubble collapsed entirely. It was interesting to see uh, what Canada was going through around the same time. Uh, they were a lot more sober about their real estate. So there was no wild ride upward in terms of real estate worth. Um, and, you know, when 2008 came around and went, uh, there was no wild real estate dive down either. Not that they were without any problems, but um, here we are. And so I imagine that uh, uh, Britain and America have a similar relationship around this time. Um, yes, they're joined at the hip in, 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 in fundamental ways, truly fundamental ways, starting with the language uh, that we both speak. So we share a lot of fundamentals, um, but, and I haven't checked uh, history books, um, if you tend to trust those, for the accuracy, uh, accuracy of the following statement, but it strikes me as plausible that um, Britain was in a somewhat, um, in a somewhat less drastic situation. Uh, uh, 1929 wasn't uh, 
as giant of a leap downward as it was for America's economy and greater population, because as economy goes, so does population. They're, they're, those two are mutually correlated. Britain probably had a subtle blur fall into and out of depression starting around 1929 and ending sometime around oh I don't know probably 1950s because you know after 1930 World War II came that was 19 you know 39 ish and then um, well into 1944 um, and then of course the effects of that took a while to recover and whatnot so you know that puts us at about 1950 <clears throat> so so okay that reframes my thinking about this article he's he's writing about it from a European perspective I think that'll be important, <clears throat> at least to uh, stop me from forcing the American perspective. All right, so that the rapid improvement in the standard of life is now going to slow down at any rate in Great Britain, okay? That a decline in prosperity is more likely than an improvement in the decade which lies ahead of us. Well... I don't know how World War II was counted, but I don't think anybody was expecting a black swan event such as World War II. Um, but then also at the, at the same rate, the, this whatever Keynes predicted is irrelevant now. Um, because, I mean, who's to say? I'm sure there was an uptick across some levels of analysis and uh, depression across other levels of analysis. <clears throat> Numbers lie in this way. Um, well, it's interesting that the paper still has value, however. So that's, he was playing the futurist in predicting how things would turn out. But uh, maybe some philosophical underpinnings of this paper uh, continue to have value. I believe that this is a vividly mistaken interpretation of what is happening to us. We are suffering not from the rheumatics of old age, <clears throat> but from the growing pains of over-rapid changes, from the painfulness of uh, a readjustment between one economic period and another. Okay, so he disagrees... Uh, it's not the old age, but from the growing pains of over-rapid changes, from the painfulness of readjustment between one economic period and another. Okay, well, I'm going to tackle this part of the sentence later, but right now I want to focus on from the growing pains of over-rapid changes. Yes, um, I, I, I like... Terence McKenna for this one. Um, he talks about how we can perceive our reality as an increase in novelty, increase in uh, complexity, therefore. That is the fundamental nature of our reality, um, as per Terence McKenna. And I uh, <laughs> have a tendency to agree with Terence McKenna on almost everything. Um, Actually, why am I pulling punches? The man is a genius. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so, so, so the economic reality of John Maynard Keynes, in his mind, it was this increase in novelty that we were having a hard time coping with and managing, and of course. From that, this fundamental perspective, nothing has changed. 
there's there continues to be greater increase in novelty my end of technology diatribe earlier um, we've reached the saturation point um, something's about to break um, I think it's our attention span um, but probably not in the way you assume it's gonna go the other way um, so 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 this this inability to uh, this inability to cope with changes too many variables too many balls in the air to juggle to uh, reach for such metaphors and so it really uh, helps us focus the mind on what we need to control for. And what we need to control for is the variables. Um, the changes out there will not cease to be. They will continue. And so personally, professionally, uh, uh, what I've tr been trying to do is um, <clears throat> lower the variables. Um, so, not just rapid changes, but over rapid changes. So that's next level. Um, so this strikes me as a kind of an ongoing problem that's only getting worse. And as, and as a trend, it's interesting to, to see that it has always been there. From the painfulness of a readjustment between one economic period and another painfulness of the adjustment period one economic period well I don't know what he means by one economic period and another other than it's two different economic periods but I'm not sure how they differ the oh maybe the next sentence will reveal that the increase of technical efficiency has been taking place faster than we can deal with the problem of labor labor absor absorption the increase of technical efficiency has been taking place faster than we can deal with the problem of labor, labor absorption. Ah, yes, okay. The innovation is outpacing training. So this is another common theme. Um, innovation is outpacing training. Innovation... Um, or the increase of technical efficiency, right? That's just another way of saying over rapid changes. Uh, so the increase of technical efficiency has been taking place faster than we can deal with the problem of labor absorption, right? So um, innovation is pulling ahead of our ability to know what to do with it. Ha! There we do. There we go. <laughs> uh, it's so so. Nothing has changed in hundred years. Um, interesting. The improvement in the standard of life has been a little too quick. That's an interesting moral position. The improvement in the standard of life has been a little too quick. That's a really interesting moral position. I'm going to keep an eye on you, Keynes. The banking and monetary system of the world has been preventing the rate of interest from falling as fast as equilibrium requires. Right. Okay. So nothing has changed. Okay. So um, the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve, um, uh, has been a successful experiment in abstracting money. Um, an intermediary body that that uh, sets the interest rates um, and thus can muck around with the machinery of the economy at the code base level at the boot up bootstrap system level of acting at the 
BIOS level, at the CMOS level. Um, by adjusting the interest rate, you adjust to the economy. Um, and in any case, so uh, we've detached dollar from, well, first we've attached dollar to some kind of a world standard. Then we detached dollar from gold. Um, then we detached dollar from itself, credit cards. Then we detached um, um, numbers in a computer um, from money entirely. Well, from traditional money. We went into Bitcoin, right? Um, uh, uh, a parallel structure in some ways. Uh, so we just keep abstracting uh, away from what is truly valuable, what we hold to be truly valuable, gold, and we just uh, uh, keep abstracting further and further away. And I wonder where does it end? Where is the next abstraction going to go? Now that we have a parallel Bitcoin system, what do we do with it? What do we do with the old one? Um, so a period of transition is taking place at the moment. A lot of us are straddling both. <laughs> but I think none of us would um, prefer to straddle either. Um, at the core of what we want to do and be is free from worry about money. Um, and people are starting to realize that they can make these choices along the way. Um, and Bob's your uncle. Uh, um, we deprecate both systems, perhaps. Who knows? Um, but it's, in a weird sense, comforting to see that as things change, things stay the same. So banking and monetary system of the world has been preventing the rate of interest from falling as fast as equilibrium requires. So he can't muck around with the interest rate directly, and so this is his attempt at doing that. All right, Keynes. And even so, the waste and confusion which ensue relate to not more than 7.5% of the national income. We are muddling away one of the sixpence in the, I guess, pound, and have only 18 cents, 60, when we might. If we were more sensible, have... Oh, Jesus, okay. Uh, skipping this section. Right, so, so, so this is uh, him laying out a bit of math. Um, and um, it's fireworks for the mind, you know? Pew, 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 pew. Look at all these numbers. You do them yourself. You'll see that I'm right. Or better yet, be lazy and just assume I'm right. Um, not to say that he's not right. Who knows? Who doesn't matter at this point? Um, we forget that in 1929, so the year before, the physical output of the industry of Great Britain was greater than ever before. Hmm, I don't think we forget that, Keynes. I don't think we knew that. Um, and that the net surplus of our foreign balance available for new foreign investment after paying for all of our imports was greater last year than that of any other country, being indeed 50% greater than the corresponding surplus of the United States. <sighs> okay, I'm going to come back to this. <clears throat> Let's try this again. We forget that in 1929 the physical output of the industry of Great Britain was greater than ever before, and that the net surplus of our foreign balance available for new foreign investment after paying for all our imports 
was greater last year than that of any other country, being indeed 50% greater than the corresponding surplus of the United States. Interesting. So the physical output is up. Foreign investments up. Or again, if it is to be a matter of comparison, suppose that we were to reduce our wages by a half, repudiate four-fifths of the national debt, and hoard our surplus wealth in barren gold instead of laying it, landing it to 6% or more, we should resemble the, the how much envied France we should resemble the now much envied France. Wow. Whew. Okay. We should resemble the now much envied France. That's quite the turn of phrase there, Keynes. But would it be an improvement? No. All right. So he's making a point that it's working. Whatever they're doing, it's working. Fine. The prevailing world depression. Well, there it is. He acknowledges... Uh, what's going on in America, the enormous anomaly of unemployment in a world full of wants, this is that, the disastrous mistakes we have made blind us to what is going on under the surface, to the true interpretation of the trend of things. For I predict that both of the two opposed errors of pessimism, which now make so much noise in the world, will be proven wrong in our own time. The pessimism of the revolutionaries who think that things are so bad that nothing can save us but violent change. And the pessimism of the reactionaries who consider the balance of our economic and social life so precarious that we must must risk no experiment. I see. So Keynes is here laying himself out as the middle way, the Buddhist way, the reasonable way, I suppose. Uh, exaggerate the cons of traditionalism. Exaggerate the uh, cons of the war uh, and take the middle route. Well, so we didn't. Uh, the history went in the direction of the war. So Keynes didn't. Wouldn't do anything to preclude that from happening. But it's interesting how he laid it out. My purpose in this essay, okay, however, is not to examine the present or the near future, but to disembarrass myself of short views and take wings into the future. That's cute. I like that disembarrass myself of short views. He blames himself for being short-sighted. In the process, he also orients the reader around his values and take wings into the future. That is his value. What can be reasonable, what can we reasonably expect the level of our economic life to be a hundred years hence? Oh, this is getting good. Uh, so what can we reasonably expect the level of our economic life to be a hundred years hence? So this is going to be interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's Keynes, a person, predicting uh, what life is going to be like a hundred years from now at a level of analysis that is very close to our felt experience, economics. But he also has the unfortunate obstacle in his way in the form of World War II. 
So this middle way that he is undoubtedly about to lay out in front of us uh, never really got a chance to, you know, never really got a chance. Um, and so, given the fact that there was a war in between, um, one world and many regional, it'll be interesting to see how his predictions play out. What are the economic possibilities for our grandchildren? From the earliest times of which we have record back, say, to 2,000 years before Christ, down to the beginning of the 18th century, there was no very great change in the standard of the life of the average man living in the civilized centers of the earth. I like how the Brits spell center, centres, you know, this, this word, centres. I like that. Ups and downs, certainly. Visitations of plague, famine, and war, golden intervals, but no progressive violent change. Okay. Um, some periods perhaps so percent better than other set the utmost one percent better in the four thousand years which ended saying okay, I I'm not even gonna try to decipher this mangled uh um transcription this slow rate of progress or lack of progress was due to two reasons to the remarkable absence of important technical improvements and the failure of capital to accumulate yeah i've now this is taking me back to high school um it's um it's a point of view that pervaded my education circa fifth grade. Um, well, so it's interesting to sort of see which one of the influencers or the leading thought thinkers, um, the kind of impact that uh, it ends up having on the future. Uh, this failure for capital to accumulate is one of the great pillars of capitalism. Uh, we want the capital to accumulate. Especially when we're the ones accumulating the capital. So a remarkable absence of important technical improvements. This is peculiar. This is truly remarkable. <laughs> is it that we're biased and we think that technical improvements that happened in the, say, last hundred years or, say, two hundred years outpace the previous eons by a huge margin? Perhaps we reached some kind of a tipping point, a downhill slope, historically speaking, where we pick up speed. Or could there be something entirely different? Like, your brain in a jar. I'm a brain in a jar. The simulation theory, or as it's known <clears throat> in Hermeticism as the first principle, that everything is in the mind. The matrix, if you will. And so, 
it's not that nothing happened for eons, it's that nothing ever happened until you came into existence. Maybe something like that. The absence of important technical inventions between the prehistoric age and comparatively modern times is truly remarkable. I agree, Keynes. Almost everything which really matters and which the world possessed at the commencement of the modern age was already known to man at the dawn of history. Language, fire, the same domestic animals which we have today, wheat, barley, the vine, the vine, and the olive, the plow, the wheel, the ore, the sail, leather, linen, and cloth, bricks and pots, gold and silver, copper, tin, and lead and iron was added to the list before 100 BC. Banking, statecraft, mathematics, astronomy, and religion. There is no record of when we first possessed these things. Oh my God, this is amazing. So, yeah, that makes sense because the Sumerian tablets were discovered um, 30 years ago. Uh, we'll look it up in a second, but... Uh, um, but we know how far banking and statecraft and mathematics and astronomy and religion. We know how far back it goes. It goes back to wheat and barley and domestic animals and uh, wheel and the ore. Um, well, perhaps I exaggerate a little, but we know that Sumerians had banking and statecraft and mathematics. So that's 5,000 years ago. That's prior to the Egyptian dynasties. Um, it's as far back as the arm of history reaches. So let's go back to this. Sumerian tablets of discovery. Let's see. Oh, I disconnected myself so as to not to get interrupted. Okay, and let's look at the news. All right, let's try this one. So these are the Sumerian tablets. I'm looking for information on when Sumerian tablets were discovered. Hang on. date. Okay, so first developed around 3200 BC. Okay. Oh, is this when they were discovered? Oh, okay, so it's 1849. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, in any case, I don't know. Um, but um, I do know that, for example, who invented... Uh, well, let's go with writing. So it's a uh, cuneiform script, Mesopotamia, Mesoamerica, present-day Iraq. That's Sumer. Um, the, who invented astronomy? Or let's get, say religion. Who invented religion? 
And there we go again, 3200 BC. Uh, this is going to Sumer. I bet you. Any case. Um, <laughs> back to the lower paralithic. Uh, uh, in any case, you get the idea. Um, what Sumerians invented? Let's try that. This is the last one. Oh, so uh, I just. Okay, let's see. Okay, so as women, Sumerian city states were often at war with one another, fond of beer, writing from 3000 BC. Mathematics, measurement. Uh, so they were found in 19th century. Right. Ooh, 500,000 clay tablets, not 300,000, although this could be one of those fisherman tales. The number of clay tablets grows as time passes by. It's a wondrous thing of inflation. You get the idea. Um, but perhaps what Keynes is thinking is something along the lines of predating Sumer. And so fine. At some epoch before the dawn of history, perhaps even in one of the comfortable intervals before the last ice age, there must have been an era of progress and invention comparable to that in which we live today, but through the greater part of recorded history, there was nothing of the kind. What? I am blown away that here is John Maynard Keynes, the left brainiest of the left brainy, uh, the granddaddy of economy, the, the grand puba of materialism, is taking this giant leap of saying that uh, we are not the first. We're not the first civilization to reach this advanced technological age. This is a common refrain that many say conspiracy theorists are singing, Graham Hancock. Um, there was a guy on Joe Rogan last week, uh, Robert Schock. Um, uh, I mean, so many of them, obviously, Zachariah Sitchin, etc. There's a whole lot of them. But uh, this is not uh, a feature of modern scientific dis uh, uh, discussion. Uh, this, there is no scientific landscape that takes this statement seriously that I'm aware of. And it's a shame. It's a really interesting question. In any case, the modern age opened, I think, with the accumulation of capital, which began in the 16th century. I believe, for reasons with which I must not encumber the present argument, that this was initially due to the rise of prices and the profits to which that led, which resulted from the treasure of gold and silver, silver which Spain brought from the New World into the Old. What? The modern age opened due to accumulation of capital, uh, which began in the 16th century. I gotcha. Um, I have problems with this. I have numerous problems with this. This, First of all, it's a giant leap. Um, I'm happy to examine it, but at face value, I reject it. Um, and then 16th century, accumulation of capital, 
like how what do you mean by accumulation of capital they were uh, wealthy states countries persons uh, kingdoms uh, municipalities uh, taverns what is accumulation of capital that we're talking about um, well but okay so let's take the premise at its face value so I suppose what he's saying is that uh, the accumulation of capital began because the prices rose and the profits, profits to which that led, which resulted from the treasure of gold and silver, which, uh, which Spain brought from the new world into the old. Whoa. To which that led, which all. Okay, uh, let's let's continue for now. From that time until today, the power of accumulation by compound interest, which seems to have been sleeping for many generations, was reborn and renewed its strength. So maybe this is where he admits that it had a resurrection in the 16th century. Um, but he acknowledges the existence of it prior maybe perhaps i'm not even certain how it's relevant so let's continue and the power of compound interest over 200 years is such as to stagger the imagination all right fine uh, i'm reminded of that story of a print not prince a pauper who saved a king's daughter a king rewarded him with one wish, whatever he wished, he desired something like a grain of rice, but it had to um, double the previous amount every time. In other words, the Fibonacci sequence or the golden ratio. Uh, and the exponential, exponentiality of that is obviously staggering, um, but also quite easy to imagine if you have a basic understanding of the Fibonacci sequence. pattern there we go that's a good one all right so it's a series of numbers where a number is found by adding up the two numbers before it that's what it was i think starting with zero and then one uh, and so forth so in any case uh, i forgot the frequency with which the papa received his grains maybe it was daily but you can see how um in one, two, three, four, five, six, let's say seven. It's eight grains of rice. Um, but how quickly that expands. Let's try this. Well, in any case, if you want more information on this, um, Google it. All right, let me give you an illustration of this, a sum which I have worked out. The value of Great Britain's foreign investments today is estimated at about, whatever this number is, uh, for, it's hard to think that that's a billion. Hang on. A number with six Z six Oh, that's no what? No, it is a billion. Okay. All right, maybe I asked it wrong, but yeah. So yeah, it's hard to think that this is four billion um, that does it's not a large number 
Wow. I don't think this speaks much to the... I'm not sure how to say this. It's the inflation that has made this number seem small to me. Not the proportion, proportional uh, foreign investment volume of Britain. Um, yeah, I don't quite have an idea or conception of what their foreign investments are these days, but in any case, the number felt very small. Anyways, this yields us an income at the rate of about 6.5%. Half of this we bring home and enjoy. The other half, namely 3.5%, we leave to accumulate abroad at compound interest. Something of this sort has now been going on for about 250 years. Make that 350 years. So Britain lives off uh, compound interest. That's what paid for the wedding. For I trace the beginnings of British foreign investments to the treasure which Drake stole from Spain in 1580. Damn, Drake. You a bad man. In that year, he returned to England, bringing with him the prodigious spoils of the Golden Hind. Huh. Golden Ass. That's interesting. Queen Elizabeth was a considerable shareholder in the syndicate, which had financed the expedition. Hmm. Out of her share, she paid off the whole of England's foreign debt, balanced her budget, and found herself with about £40,000 in hand. This she invested in the Levant Company, which prospered. Out of the profits of the Levant Company, the East India Company was founded. Wow. And the profits of this great enterprise were the foundation of England's subsequent foreign investment. Now it happens that 40,000 accumulating a 3% compound interest approximately corresponds to the actual volume of England's foreign investments at various dates and would actually amount today to the total of 4 billion, which I have already quoted as being what our foreign investments now are. Thus, every pound which Drake brought home in 1580 has now become 100,000. Such is the power of compound interest. Man, Keynes, forget compound interest. This is a great lesson in how not only England, but I, I guess it's embodied in the uh, Queen, um, the British crown, came into being. Like This is the mechanics of the finances of what went on behind the scene. And I'm sure this is greatly oversimplified. But just to sort of get the uh, stretch of those uh, 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 few hundred years and see how it all played out, um, it's quite illuminating and interesting. I just find it extremely fascinating. Okay, from the 16th century, with the cumulative crescendo after the 18th, the great age of science and technical inventions began, which since the beginning of the 19th century has been in full flood coal steam. Oh, full flood. Coal, steam, electricity, petrol, steel, rubber, cotton, and the chemical industries automatic machinery, and the methods of mass production, wireless printing, Newton, Darwin, Einstein, and thousands of other things, and men too famous and familiar to catalog. Right. A lot of things happen. This is going back to the previous point of increasing um, rapid change.
Okay, so what is the result? In spite of an enormous growth in the population of the world, which it has been necessary to equip with houses and machinery, the average standard of life in Europe and the United States has been raised, I think, about fourfold. The growth of capital has been on a scale which is far beyond a hundredfold of what any previous age had known. And from now on, we need to expect so great an increase of population. And from now on, we need not expect so great an increase of population. Wow. Well, that was way off. World population trend. Let's take a look at this. So in 1927, yep, there it is. Two billion. I was going to say two billion because the numbers that I remember. Well, I was going to say four, but it could have been six. I don't remember. Um, just as a child, I think the first sense of the number of people in the world, I, I think that number was, I guess, five billion, but five doesn't sound right. And six billion sound like it's too late. And four billion sounds like some old information. But I think that might have been the case, right? Because it's... It's not like these things were like so easily accessible. The information couldn't be collated so quick. Yeah, so it was four billion. Wow, might have even been two billion. That's how um, delayed of uh, information trickled down into the population prior to the internet, like. Um, I had suspected 1927 there were about 2 billion people that was I suspected that um, but I wasn't sure how this would play out in any case now we have well let's go 100 years hence right 1927 so yeah Sorry, man, 2027. That's a tremendous increase. We're expected to have 8 billion people um, 100 years hence. So Keynes was way off on that one. If capital increased, but, but also the war. You know, the war had a lot to do with the population expansion, expansion contraction. Uh, if capital increases, say 2% per annum, the capital equipment of the world will have increased by a half in 20 years and seven and a half times in 100 years. Think of this in terms of material things, houses, transport, and the like. At the same time, technical improvements in manufacturing and transport have been proceeding at a greater rate in the last 10 years than ever before in history. In the United States, factory output per head was 40% greater in 1925 than in 1919. Um, this statement I have zero confidence in. To, to, to have been on the producing end of statistics and to know how the sausage is made. I have zero confidence that um, people a hundred years from now were any better than we are today and we suck today at gathering this kind of information. In any case, 
In Europe, we are held back by temporary obstacles, but even so, it is safe to say the technical efficiency is increasing by more than 1% per annum compound. There is evidence that the revolutionary technical changes, which have so far chiefly affected industry, may soon be attacking agriculture. We may be on the eve of improvements in the efficiency of food production, as great as those which have already taken place in mining, <clears throat> manufacture, and transport. In quite a few years, in our own lifetimes, I mean, we may be able to perform all the operations of our agriculture, mining, and manufacture with a quarter of the human effort to which we have been accustomed. I think this has come to pass. For the moment, the very rapid rapidity of these changes is hurting us and bringing difficult problems to solve. Those countries are suffering relatively which are not in the vanguard of progress. It's interesting note. We are being afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come, namely technological unemployment. Well, look at that. Keynes was truly on the vanguard of his own. This means unemployment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. But this is only a temporary phase of maladjustment. All this means, in the long run, that mankind is solving its economic problem. I would predict that the standard of life in progressive countries 100 years hence will be between four and eight times as high as it is today. There would be nothing surprising in this even in the light of our present knowledge. It would not be foolish to contemplate the possibility of a far greater progress still, between four and eight times. Standard of life in progressive countries, 100 years hence, will be between four and eight times as high as it is today. So, with my limited knowledge of the kind of life I would have led 100 years ago in England or in America, Would I say that we are four and eight times as high? Is my standard of living four to eight times higher? I think it's an underestimate. Uh... It might be closer to 400 to 800 times as high as it is today. It's easy to say that because it's hard to define what that means. But just... <clears throat> How do we define it? Standard of living, you know, that that would be that would have to be a matter of some debate. Um, for example, uh, one way in which Keynes may have defined standard of living is something to do with physical labor type of output. Uh, but we have today who out people who output more physical labor at a local gym than an average person did a hundred years ago during their work a day. And so how do we define standard of living? Ha overall happiness? How do you measure it? Hmm. There's a lot of questions here. Moving on. 
there would be nothing surprising in this even in the light of our present knowledge. It would not be foolish to contemplate the possibility of a far greater progress still. Right. Okay. Let us, <clears throat> for the sake of argument, suppose that a hundred years hence we are all of us, on the average, eight times better off in the economic sense than we are today. Uh, absurdly, there need be nothing here to surprise us. <sighs> this is leading me towards some unpleasant conclusions. One of which being that, if you recall, Keynes laid out three paths. The too traditional, too stodgy, too monolithic, too um, too um, devoid of innovation. Right? There's there's that path, and then there's the path of war, which we ended up taking. And then there was the middle way, the way that um, the way in which Keynes uh, presents this, his way, the reasonable way, is not the way we went. We went by the way of war. And uh, here we are, I would say, much more better off much more better off that's doesn't sound right but nothing else quite captures it and so war is good it's the unpleasant conclusion that this is taking me to great I just rationalized myself into war you know, for history. This is why you can't trust the intellect. You know? Let us, for the sake of argument, suppose that a hundred years hence, we are, we are all of us, on the average, eight times better off in the econo economic sense than we are today. Uh, uh, assuredly, there need be nothing here to surprise us, yes. Now, it is true that the needs of human beings may seem to be insatiable, but they fall into two classes. Oh, all right. I like the economies. Let's check it out. Those needs which are absolute in the sense that we feel them, whatever the situation of our fellow human beings may be, and those which are relative in the sense that we feel them only if their satisfaction lifts us above, makes us feel superior to our fellows. Needs of the second class, those which satisfy the desire for superiority, may indeed be insatiable. For the higher the general level, the higher still are they. But this is not so true of the absolute needs. A point may soon be reached, much sooner perhaps than we are all of us aware of, when these needs are satisfied in the sense that we prefer to devote our further energies to non-economic purposes. Oh, okay. Right. So, there's a lot to unpack here. So first he class, but I want to start from behind. So let's start from behind. So um, in my uh, uh, commenting on the content, uh, it has slipped my mind that this is about working 15 hours per week. Um, that is the sort of uh, the hook, the chorus of the, the refrain of this particular uh, research well, of this particular thought piece. Um, so it's kind of nice to be reminded of uh, that all of this has been a preamble to really this part, um, working 15 hours per week. Um, okay, now he 
and and again unpacking and um, kind of going backwards. He recognizes that there's um, two kinds of needs, uh, and I guess one way to think of them would be uh, rational, irrational. Uh, it's rational to want to not starve to death. That is a real and true need. It is irrational to demand the latest iPhone. Right? Good job synthesizing. Wow. All right. Um, okay. And, and, and you understand that there's some wiggle room, right? We're insatiable. And so that line of insatiability moves around, moves about. Okay, so now for my conclusion, which you will find, I think, to become more and more startling to the imagination the longer you think about it. I drew the conclusion that assuming no important wars and no important increase in population, the economic problem may be solved, or be at least within sight of solution within a hundred years. Well, that is a really mature way to think about it, the economic problem, right? Career is not a um, thing to aspire to. It's an economic problem. Because Career locks you into an archetype, and most certainly whatever's inside of you that's original doesn't fit the polished archetypes of the workplace, but rather the overarching great archetypes that the myths are made of is probably what's closer to your true nature. The kinds of archetypes of which myths are made of are not welcomed inside a corporate milieu. And so we have a kind of a responsibility and a duty to ourselves to to do what? To solve the economic problem at the level of analysis of money. So that you may free yourself the rest of the time in order to develop. Yourself into such things upon which myths are made of. It's a, a tremendously powerful reframe. Thank you, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, this whole article was worth the juice just for that one bit, to my mind. Okay. This means that the economic problem is not if we not if we look into the future, the permanent problem of the human race. This means that the economic problem is not. Okay, I'm. I'm going to ignore that last sentence because I'm failing to make, I'm failing to articulate it properly. Um, I blame the writing. Why, you may ask, is this so startling? It is startling because if instead of looking into the future, we look into the past, we find that the economic problem, the struggle for subsistence, always has been hitherto the primary, most pressing problem of the human race not only of the human race, but of the whole of the biological kingdom from the beginnings of life in its most primitive force, the struggle for subsistence.
the gift that keeps on giving. Thus, we have been expressly evolved by nature with all, all our impulses and deepest instincts for the purpose of solving the economic problem. If the economic problem is solved, mankind will be deprived of its traditional purpose. Yes. Yes. This is very much relatable. Will this be a benefit? If one believes at all in the real values of life, the prospect at least opens up the possibility of benefit. Sure. Yet I think with dread of the readjustment of the habits and instincts of the ordinary man, bred into him for countless generations, which he, which he may be asked to discard within a few decades. Keynes does not underestimate this problem. This is in a lot of ways what's subtle about our circumstances today. Um, technology may have not been mature enough in Keynes' day to deliver on its promise of leisure, but today certainly technology is. Um, and then how we spend our time becomes... becomes the question to ask. Okay, yet I think um, this kind of few days, okay. Uh, to use the language of today, must we not expect a general nervous breakdown? Huh. We already have a little experience of what I mean, a nervous breakdown of the sort which is already common enough in England and the United States amongst the wives of the well-to-do classes. Unfortunate women, many of them, who have been deprived by their wealth of their traditional tasks and occupation, who cannot find it sufficiently amusing when deprived of the spur of economic necessity, to cook and clean and mend, yet are quite unable to find anything more amusing. Well, there would be maybe an unpopular opinion? Maybe? I, well, people are so sensitive today about everything. I'm sure this offends plenty. Um, it's interesting. I'm connecting it all back to Sigmund Freud and his experiences of teaching in Vienna and um, working with his patients. Hmm. To those who sweat for their daily bread, uh, leisure is a long for sweet until they get it. Um, Keynes's use of uh, dashes and commas and uh, is confusing the hell out of me. To those who sweat for their daily bread, bread leisure is a longed for, oh, longed for sweet until they get it. Whew. Uh, there is the traditional epitaph uh, written for herself by the old chairwoman. Don't mourn for me, friends. Don't weep for me never, for I am going to do nothing forever and ever. This was her heaven. Like others who look forward to leisure, she conceived how nice it would be to spend her time listening in for. There was another listening in for there was another couplet which occurred in her poem, okay? With psalms and sweet music, the heavens be ringing, but I shall have nothing to do with the singing. Ah, <laughs> that's nice. Yet it will only be for those who have to do with the singing that life will be tolerable and how few of us can sing. 
Wow. Okay, well, so let's unpack this a little bit. Um, Keynes here is tapping into a truth that's seldom articulated. And that's the truth that philosophers, such as Keynes, get their ideas from artists. Um, well, maybe they don't get their ideas from artists. I'm not saying that Keynes read this poem and conceived of this paper. It should be phrased differently. Um, artists are the ones that are listening for nuanced, subtle changes in the circumstances of our humanity. And then they express that through their art. And in this sort of primordial form, it imprints itself on the brains of innocent bystanders who just appreciate the art for what it is. But the art embeds itself and then it finds its uh, a way into the brains of philosophers who intellectualize about the nature of humanity that the artists have already spoken about through their art. And I use the word spoken very liberally. Could have been painted as well. And then through these philosophers, it filters down to the plebs like you and me. Um, and so this, now that it's been articulated, you will start to notice it more and more. Um, you don't have a name for this. Well, it's not an original observation either. Well, well it should probably be named. And then, man, this is, you know, this is a call to arts right here. This is a call to arts. I think what Keynes is talking about here is the supremacy of art the supremacy of creative thinking and creative activity as the thing that we must turn ourselves to once we solve the economic problem right um, and so I just can't find anything wrong with that at all. I am all for it. Keynes and I are on the same team. Team art. Uh, Thus, for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem. How to use his freedom from pressing economic cares how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for him to live wisely and agreeably and, well, right. The strenuous, purposeful money makers may carry all of us along with them into the lap of economic abundance, but it will be those peoples who can keep alive and cultivate into a fuller perfection the art of life itself and do not sell themselves for the means of life, who will be able to enjoy the abundance when it comes. Well, uh, this is just adding more uh, flowery prose to the point made. Yet there is no country, no people, I think, who can look forward to the age of leisure and of abundance without a dread, for we have been trained too long to strive and not to enjoy. Wow. I can't help but relate what Keynes has written in 1930 to what's happening today.
It is a fearful problem for the ordinary person with no special talent to occupy himself, especially if he no longer has roots in the soil or in custom or in the beloved conventions of a traditional society. The judge from the behavior and the achievements of the wealthy class today in any quarter of the world, the outlook is very depressing. But these are, so to speak, our advanced guard, those who are spying out the promised land for the rest of us and pitching their camp there. For they have, most of them, failed disastrously. So it seems to me, those who have an independent income but no association or duties or ties to solve the problem which has be, been set them, but has beset them, perhaps, is what is meant. I feel sure I, I would like that word better anyways, beset them. I feel sure that... With a little more experience, we shall use the newfound bounty of nature quite differently from the way in which the rich use it today, and will map out for ourselves a plan of life quite otherwise than theirs. For many ages to come, the old Adam, for many ages to come, the old Adam will be so strong in us that everybody will need to do some work if he is to be contented. We shall do more things for ourselves than is usual with the rich today, only too glad to have small duties and tasks and routines. But beyond this, we shall endeavor to spread the bread thin on the butter to make what work there is still to be done to be as widely shared as possible. Three-hour shifts or a 15-hour work week, 15-hour week may put off the problem for a great while. For three hours a day is quite enough to satisfy the old Adam in most of us. Yes, yeah. Uh, three hours a day is a good writing session. It's a good coding session. It's a good design session. These are... I mean, what else do we do on our computers? What's the fourth thing that we do on our computers? We can code software. We can write text. We can design websites and pamphlets and books and whatnot. So design writing, coding, and wasting time. There's a fourth category of wasting time of which social media is like, you know, in charge of. There are changes in other spheres to which we must expect to come when the accumulation of wealth is no longer of high social importance. There will be great changes in the code of morals. This is true. We shall be able to rid ourselves of many of the pseudo-moral principles which have hag-ridden us for 200 years, by which we have exalted some of the most distasteful of human qualities into the position of the highest virtue. We shall be able to afford to dare to assess the money motive at its true value. The love of money as a possession, as distinguished from the love of money as a means to the enjoyment and royal realities of life, will be recognized for what it is, a somewhat disgusting morbidity, one of those semi-criminal, semi-pathological propensities which one hands over with a shudder to the specialists in mental disease. All kinds of social customs and economic practices affecting the distribution of wealth and of economic reward and penalties, which we now maintain at all costs, however distasteful and unjust they may be in themselves, because they are tremendously useful in promoting the accumulation of capital, we shall then be free, at least, to discard. 
Wow, that's a, that sentence is uh, difficult to read, comprehend, or understand, but I get the gist, Keynes. Um, I think what's at the core of what Keynes is saying, and I absolutely agree, and that is that, you know, we don't want money. We want to be free from worry about money. Um, and, and that's true, well, it's true of me. I don't know if it's true of you. Of course, there will be still, of course, there will still be many people with intense, unsatisfied purposiveness. Purposive. What? What word is this? Purposive. Having. Serving or done with a purpose. Purposiveness, I guess. Unsatisfied purposiveness. Whew, that's a... A hundred years ago, you know, the, um, the language evolves. Um, and this may have been uh, mildly uh, awkward a hundred years ago um, to a reader. Uh, to me, unsatisfied purposiveness who will blindly pursue wealth unless they can find some plausible substitute. Yeah, uh, terrible, terrible writing, just terrible. Um, but really great ideas, really great. But the rest of us will no longer be under any obligation to applaud and encourage them. For we shall inquire more curiously than is safe today into the true character of this purposiveness, purposiveness, which, with which in varying degrees nature has endowed almost all of us. For purposiveness means that we are more concerned with the remote future results of our action than with their own quality or their immediate effects on our own environment. The purposive, the purpose. Let me get this uh, articulated by Google. Purposive. Purposive. All right. The purpose of man is always trying to secure a spurious and delusive immorality for his acts by pushing his interest in them forward into time. He does not love his cat, but his cat's kittens, nor in truth the kittens, but only the kitten's kittens, and so on forward forever to the end of catdom. For him, jam is not jam unless it is a case of jam tomorrow and never jam today. Thus, by pushing his jam always forward into the future, he strives to secure for his act of boiling it in immortality. Wow, this is some deeply alchemical knowledge that's being uh, presented here. Uh, this, so first of all, um, I'd like to compliment Keynes on his analogies, the kitten thing and the jam thing. That's, that's a really good way to structure this. But then the thing that it does, it, um, it takes the reader into the perspective of a much longer term than the reader is accustomed to. Like, for example, to a child thinking in terms of decades or hundreds of years it's completely meaningless um, and it's not that different to a 20 year old either um, you think about uh, we rarely look at our 
selves and our actions when we're 20 or 30 um, in terms of its place in history or its place in the evolutionary chain that we are a part of or um, or look at ourselves as an action of a, of a, um, a thing that exists during a brief period of time during which our sun was shining some, you know, bazillion years. Um, we don't think of ourselves in those terms. And for a good reason, right? It's a lot for a mind to grasp. Um, but this cat is good because cats don't live that long and the um you get to see multiple generations of cats if you're lucky um, and so it's easily to then transpose that onto yourself and other humans um, really really terrific i mean i felt i got a lot of out of this um thing um uh, halfway through but I mean, this is Really good. Big fan. Let me remind you of the professor in Sylvie and Bruno. Only the tailor, sir, with your little bill, said a meek voice outside the door. Ah, well, I can soon settle his business, the professor said to the children. If you'll just wait a minute, how much is it? This year, my man, the tailor had come in while he was speaking. Well, it's been a doubling so many years, you see, the tailor replied a little gruffly, little gruffy, and I think I'd like the money now. It's 2,000 pounds, it is. Oh, that's nothing, the, press, uh, the professor carelessly. Get a little tired. Oh, that's nothing, the professor carelessly remarked, feeling in his pocket as if he always carries at least that amount about with him. But wouldn't you like to wait just another year and make it 4,000? Just think how rich you'd be. Why, you might be a king if you liked. I don't know as I'd care about being a king, the man said thoughtfully, but uh, it do sound a powerful sight o' oh, money. Well, I think I'll wait. <laughs> of course you will, said the professor. There's good sense in you, I see. Good day to you, my man. Will you ever have to pay him that four thousand pounds? Sylvie asked as the door closed on the departing creditor. Never, my child, the professor replied empathically. He'll go on doubling it till he dies. You see, it's always worthwhile waiting another year to get twice as much money. Perhaps it is not an accident that the race which did most to bring the promise of immortality into the heart and essence of our religions, has also done most for the principle of compound interest, and particularly loves this most purposive of human institutions. Okay, I'm going to take a break, get something to, to eat, come back to this, uh, because I'm veining. Waning, waning, that's the word, waning. All right, let's try that again. <clears throat> Perhaps it is not an accident that the race, he means human race, which did most to bring the promise of immortality into the heart and essence of our religions, has also done most for the principle of compound interest, and particularly loves this most purposive of human institutions. A couple of things that are interesting here. Um, he juxtaposes the promise of immortality against the compound interest. And so that's interesting. Well, let's focus on immortality uh, first. So uh, he places immortality into the hands of religions. So 
all this sort of uh, science fiction and nanotechnology and AI and uh, augmented reality and all of these things. Um, well, it's it's all cutting edge technology, but it's all leading. Uh, oh, I, oh, I how I I forgot about human longevity projects as well. Um, quantum computing, yeah. Now it's flooding back. So there's a lot of um, <laughs> technologies for fulfilling the religions premise and a promise uh, which is interesting um, and uh, and then compound interest uh, so he apparently is a big fan of uh, compound interest and in reading this um, thing um, I've sort of uh, convinced myself of uh, compound interest as a um, worthwhile thing um, because unbeknownst to me I connected it to the Fibonacci sequence and Fibonacci well when you uh, scrape the surface of design of things and you look underneath you'll find the golden ratio the Fibonacci sequence it's everywhere in nature it's everywhere in design um, and clearly it's a uh, thing that uh, Haynes Keynes has um, set as his superordinate value or a metric or an indicator maybe it's an indicator is a good way to think about it so so it's interesting uh, that um, Here's an economics paper from 100 years ago talking about immortality. Um, I see us free, therefore, to return to some of the most sure and certain principles of religion and traditional virtue, that avarice is a vice, that the ex exaction of usury is a misdemeanor, and the love of money is detestable that those walk must truly that those walk must truly in the paths of virtue and sane wisdom who take last thought for the morrow wow so this is i'm i didn't expect any of this i had no idea um, that the uh, Yale economist would, uh, you know, this guy who's like a highly regarded, uh, he's not highly regarded, man. He's like Grand Puba of uh, ancient economy. Um, highly regarded, influential thinker to other highly regarded economists right that's that's sort of like that's his stock and trade right there um and then to he packs a lot of punch so to see him talk about this so uh, he he wants to go back to um certain principles of religion and traditional virtue so once again, I'm reminded of the uh, of that the greatest of all human thinkers, Terence McKenna, um, who talks about uh, archaic values a lot. Um, it's um, it's It's difficult for me to say this because my original programming and imprint doesn't support this statement. Um, but I suspect, and I suspect that because everything else Terence McKenna has said it turned out to be true, I suspect that it is also true. Um, 
And in any case, he was convinced that our natural state of being was in some kind of a, you know, Eden paradise like bliss on a pile that, and what I mean by pile, I mean a pile of bodies. Um, you know, kind of a, a moon cycled sexual ecstasy where everything is shared. Um, and there was no sense of property or even self. Um, well, I don't do it uh, justice in sort of bringing that to uh, to mind, uh, but um, but it's exactly this traditional virtue that uh, Keynes is talking about as well. Um, in any case, avarice, avarice is a great word. I'm a huge fan. Um, extreme greed for wealth or material gain. It's a vice that the exaction of usury, this is, um, young people may not be familiar with this word. I wasn't. Um, it's uh, interest that banks and credit card companies and everybody else charges you on money that they lend you. Um, and uh, Shakespeare's, uh, you know, the whole pound of flesh was about that. Um, but the details escape me and they're not important right now. Uh, love of money is detestable. Those that walk more... To hear an economist, a highly regarded economist, say this, it's uh, interesting. Those that walk most truly in the paths of virtue and sane wisdom would take last thought for the morrow. That's also a really powerful statement. Last thought for the morrow. So what he's saying is, don't worry about tomorrow. Wait, what is Morrow? The following day, right? So, let's see. Love and that those walk most truly in the paths of virtue and sane wisdom who take last thought for the morrow. This is a kind of like a, a be here now kind of message, which is once again very interesting. Uh, okay. We shall once more value ends above means and prefer the good to the useful. We shall honor those who can teach us how to pluck the hour and the day virtuously and well. Oh, we shall honor those who can teach us how to pluck the hour and the day virtuously and well. The delightful people who are capable of taking direct enjoyment in things the lilies of the field who toil not, neither do they spin. I am pleasantly surprised and uh, simultaneously flabbergasted to hear the echoes of uh, Zen and Buddhism and Taoism and uh, Enlightenment and alchemy, Gnosticism. I'm, I am surprised to hear it in this paper, but it's all there. But beware, the time for all this is not yet. For at least another hundred years, we must pretend to ourselves and to everyone that fair is foul and foul is fair. Ah, yes, the compromises we make for money, yes. For foul is useful and fair is not. Right, avarice and usury and precaution must be our gods for a little longer still. For only they can lead us out of the tunnel of economic necessity into daylight. Well, amen, Keynes. I look forward, therefore, in days not so very remote, 
to the greatest change which has ever occurred in the material environment of life for human beings in the aggregate. But of course, it will all happen gradually, not as a catastrophe. Indeed, it has already begun. The course of affairs will simply be that there will be ever larger and larger classes and groups of people from whom problems of economic necessity have been practically removed. And that is the class we want to belong to. Um, the critical difference will be realized when this condition has become so general that the nature of one's duty to one's neighbor is changed. Interesting. That's introducing a new idea to what's effectively the end of this essay. Let's see how he um, digs himself out of it. The critical difference will be realized when this condition has become so general that the nature of one's duty to one's neighbor is changed. For it will remain reasonable to be economically purposeful for others after it has ceased to be reasonable to oneself. Let's do that again. For it will remain reasonable to be economically purposive for others after it has ceased to be reasonable for oneself. It will be realized when the conditions become as soon as one has changed, but it will remain reasonable to be economically. Oh, very interesting. It's very interesting. The pace at which we can reach our destination of economic bliss will be governed by four things, our power to control population, our determination to avoid wars and civil dissensions, our willingness to entrust, let me go, oh, that what dog is barking at. All right, let's try that again. The pace at which we can reach our destination of economic bliss will be governed by four things, our power to control population, our determination to avoid wars and civil dissensions, our willingness to entrust to science the direction of these matters which are properly the concern of science, and the rate of accumulation is fixed by the margins between our production and our consumption, of which the last will easily look after itself, given the first tree. Okay, I want to take this into the realm of self. Um, I want to look at the uh, four things uh, from the perspective of a singular individual. What does our power to control population uh, mean to a singular individual? I think chiefly it uh, has to do with having kids. Um, that is one way in which um, an individual is capable of controlling their economic future. Because once you have kids, you're no longer in control. Uh, this broadly extends to any other immediate presence, certainly lifelong attachment type of uh, arrival into the family, let's say. Our determination to avoid wars and civil dissensions. So in other words, my determination to avoid arguments, fights, and civil dissensions. And uh, I'm down with that. Our willingness to entrust to science the direction of these matters which are properly the concerns of science? Well, sure. I guess 100 years ago, science needed some proponents. Um, it still does. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I guess uh, 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 it's hard to argue with that. The, qu the question is to what, what things do we apply science to? And... Um, Where's the line? 
Um, and the rate of accumulation as fixed by the margin between our production and our consumption, of which the last will easily look after itself, given the first three. So, three. Uh, so So it's really between accumulation and consumption. Or accumulation and production. Or he's saying that the margins will be fine as long as the population, dissensions, and science are in place. Right, okay. Okay. Well, so so this is the what's important, right? Um, rate of accumulation as fixed by the margin between our production and our consumption. Uh, so after you consume, you have to produce something so that you can consume again. And then you produce something, go to work. Then you spend time away from work, not making money, making money, not making money, making money, not making money. Mm, because you keep making slightly more uh, during production than you, than you waste during consumption, your margins have gone up and you have accumulation, thus you can increase the amount of time between consumption and jumping back to production. So, that's interesting. Okay, meanwhile, there will be no harm in making mild preparations for our destiny in encouraging and experimenting in the arts of life as well as the activities of purpose. I think this is um, uh, the dog didn't bark type of scenario. Um, there's an old, I think it's the first Sherlock Holmes uh, story uh, about the uh, dog who didn't bark. Um, there was a murder in the stables. Uh, some way or another, uh, Sherlock Holmes found out that uh, whoever approached the stables to commit the murder must have been known to the dog because the dog didn't bark, you see. Um, the dog knew the person. The, do uh, the person was a familiar to the dog. And so the dog, in other words, doesn't have a reason to bark unless he's barking for himself. Um, he doesn't bark to protect. He can't prevent a crime. I can't even alarm you to it. Because to the dog, the criminal's not there. And so by the same token, uh, John Maynard Keynes here, I feel like he's, um, he's the dog that didn't bark. You know, he's, he's barking here, and he's barking for a reason. I think this is the reason. Um, I think uh, he's trying to change hearts and minds of people. Um, in, um, and primarily... Uh, Maybe um, making his position and intention better known, uh, which resonates with me very much. But chiefly, do not let us overestimate the importance of the economic problem or sacrifice it is to its supposed necessities other matters of greater and more permanent significance. It should be a matter for specialists like dentistry. If economics could manage to get themselves through uh, thought of as humble, competent people on a level with dentists, 
that would be splendid. Okay. I'm sure that made sense to him back then. Uh, but there it is. So what are we to make of this paper? He started offering the middle way, saying that's what it is. Um, if you go to war, that's bad. If you're too traditional, that's too bad. But we went to war. Um, our uh, quality of life has improved orders of magnitude more than the leading economics predicted, assuming no war. So did the war ensure our higher standard of living somehow? That's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, the answer ought to be no, but, I mean, I'm just looking at what happened here. Um, and then he talks about, uh, he gets down to the uh, real nitty-gritty. He says, 15 hours per week, three hours a day, you know, roughly, uh, which falls right in line with the sort of tempo that I can myself maintain. And I'm thinking about it in long term, you know, given the fact that um, a college student graduating today is going to live to be 150, probably, maybe longer, unless, of course, you know, another World War II happens. Um, you know, if the uh, science of human longevity continues on its current pace, yeah, it's not, a, not even up for debate. Um, so then, you know, if our careers are 100 years old, or 100, span 100 years, how are we to orient ourselves towards careers? And I think uh, um, he nails it here. It's the economic problem. It's, it's the career as itself has run its course. Um, it, it's the economic problem. How do, we, how do we solve the economic problem? Um, so that the rest of the time we don't have to. And I think it's actually a good target for optimization. So, you know, let's say, you know, listen, I, 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 I've had a 40-hour-a-week job. I didn't spend actually 40 hours. I think if people spend actual seven hours working, that's a lot. Um, but I'll, And per week. And... And what? Hmm. I forget where I was going with that. It doesn't matter. So let's uh, continue. And you're wrong. So it's a very interesting. Uh, it, it's it's deep, you know. It's. Um, I'm pretty well read. People don't speak about things in these terms anymore. Um, their statements are a lot more modulated, moderated, and sort of devoid of bite. And that's what I liked about uh, this thing. Um, Keynes was not devoid of bite, and he wasn't... Uh, um, um, afraid to put poetry in his uh, paper, which is really cool, and it's a really cool poem, too. Yeah. So he sees this problem. He puts um, his finger on an interesting psychological thing that happens when a person loses their purpose. They fall into the alchemical negrado. Uh, the abyss, the belly of the whale. Uh, you know, many words have been used to describe this place. Um, 
And then so old Adam comes along and he needs something to do and you got to give him something to do to the tune of about 15 hours per week. It's a lot in this paper. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your opinion on some of the questions, ideas, issues, problems, quandaries, descends into madness that I've raised during uh, this video. Yeah, let's, um, I'd love to hear your take on some of these things as well. Cheers.